Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Business Speak podcast. Uh, Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I'm your host, Mr. Chill. Uh, Today's episode is entitled Balancing Your Business. On the show with me today, I'm pleased to have with me Mr. Brent Haiti, uh, owner of a company called One Wave Life. And uh, looking forward to introducing Brent here in just a moment. Uh, but good morning, Brent, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful to have you. Um, now, I have a official bio here that I'm going to read. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to sort of expand upon that a bit and just mention a thing or two that I know about you from having worked with you for a bit. One of the things that I need to, you to correct me on, when I've told people about you and uh, what you do, I've sort of lumped you into a title of um, business coach. Right. I don't know if that's inaccurate, but when I look at your email signature, it's, it describes you as ideal life architect mentor and coach Mm -hmm. so i feel me calling you a business coach is somehow selling you short a little bit as to what you uh, you do um so i don't know if you have any comment on that quick before i dive into your bio but yeah um business coach is a very typical term for a lot of people and uh, i I think i try to differentiate myself a little bit from that Uh, so i use the term ideal life architect and we'll uh we'll probably address that a little bit later but um um, more of a life coach for business owners. And I think okay. the difference really is where uh, a typical business coach focuses on the business, on being able to help the business grow, make more money, operate more effectively, and so forth, where my focus is on helping the business owner both be more effective and productive in their business, uh, doing the things that they're best at doing, making the biggest contributions to the success of the business, but also being able to help them away from their business, hence mm-hmm. the, the life coach kind of an element to it. So uh, I hope I'm, I'm kind of fitting into a bit of a, a unique niche there in terms of, of how I help uh, the people that I help. So fair to say you provide a fairly well-rounded approach. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Okay. Well, let me read the official bio, and then I'll add a little bit, a couple things that I think people should know about you. Uh, it says, Brent Haiti is the founder of One Wave Life, a company focused on supporting business owners to shift from stress, overwhelm, imbalance, key word there today, and burnout to being able to thrive in business while also living a life they love. I'm sure if I stopped right now, you're all probably, probably all interested because it just said the words, live a life you love. And I don't know anyone that wouldn't be intrigued by that. Right. Over the past 35 plus years, Brent has had the experience of tremendous business success and crushing business and personal financial hardship, a tragic personal loss, and a number of health challenges limiting him in many ways. Many days over a seven year span, he was struggling just to breathe and keep himself from drowning in overwhelm, stress, grief, and a poisonous inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you listening today can identify with that, and I think that's gonna help make Brent be a little bit more relatable. He says, but he shifted. He learned so many lessons from the many entrepreneurial traps he fell into and the many difficult experiences he had. Out of that gradual shift came a personal and professional evolution that led him to create one wave life. It led him to see what matters most to him. It led him to become clear of his deeper purpose in helping people who remain stuck and drowning to help them step onto a path where they can avoid or overcome these traps and be professionally successful while also experiencing personal fulfillment, joy, and happiness. He lives and breathes the work-life balance he supports others to achieve. Now that's where the official bio for Brent ends yes but let me just make a couple of comments and maybe ask you a question or two all right first comment and i will say this i 
I should back up. There's a financial advisor that I will often refer to, and one of the reasons I love referring to him is because he will never advise his clients to invest in anything that he doesn't personally also have skin in the game in. Right. And so you can trust that when he says, hey, you know what, you're going to want to invest in this, he's not going to advise you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. And so one of the things I love about the time I've gotten to know you over the last several years is you have a big goal and you have a great help to your clients, but you practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. You don't just, I'm going to do whatever I want, but when I'm in front of a client, I'm going to tell them what they need to know. It's, I want to set the example. Yeah. I want to make sure that if I'm telling my clients they need a good work-life balance, and however we're going to dive into that in a bit, um, that I'm practicing what I'm inviting them to do. And I love that about you, and I think it adds a lot of authenticity and passion for what you do and why you do it. One of the questions I can have for you, and you don't have to answer it, especially if it's too personal, but you've mentioned in here personal loss, financial hardship, health challenges, yeah, struggling at parts of it to even want to just breathe being a success. Is there anything you want to dive into that before we get into the episode today? Anything you feel like you want to share that might be help anyone? Yeah, you know, um, I think from my own perspective from my own past it's uh, it, it it's a part of why I'm on the path that I'm on right I've had the experiences that I've had uh, back in the day they weren't so positive and um, and it's really because of those that I've that I am the person that I am today that I do try my best to to walk my talk each and every day that I can and and I'm not perfect I never will be but um, it helps to to bring about some of the things that I, you know that you mentioned in my bio about just being able to live a life of joy being happy being healthy and uh, and thriving in in the ways that are important to me um, without I guess going super deep into my story if, if you've got some questions on that I'd, I'd be happy to answer them but um, I I was influenced early on like so many are getting into business uh, we tend to start from the standpoint of I'm good at something and I'm working for somebody else and hey why don't I just start a business and do it myself <laughs> I'll, I'll keep all the money and I'll have all the freedom and it'll be so easy. And, <laughs> and then you step into it and then you get that sudden wake up call of, oh, not so easy, right? <laughs> and, and, and many people, not everybody, but many people do step into business that way. And, and that's the way that it was for me. Um, and I, in doing so, started to formulate a, a belief and a way of acting that that was kind of out of necessity. I didn't have the business mastery that I learned over the years. Uh, my my business partner and I at the time, we say we were, we were a little too stubborn, a little too stupid to get the help that we <laughs> needed, and we thought that we could just kind of figure it out along the way. And figuring it out along the way developed this this mentality, this mindset of just just work harder. That's what they say. Just just work longer. Uh, and, and you'll get there. You'll get the success that you want. And the success that you want is typically financial success. And in, in doing so, it puts everything else at risk. And that was, that was my, uh, my experience and the way things were. Long hours, long days, uh, bootstrapping up the start of our, of our business, of our company. And, and it worked. We did have a lot of good financial success. But it, it came at, at a number of different expenses, just that, that overwork, that, that uh, the amount of time that I was putting in. When I, uh, when I started that business, I actually uh, moved to a different town. And um, in doing so, I left behind the woman that I was dating at the time. And our plan was going to go down there, build this business up for about a year, Things will be going great. Come on back home, start up our shop up here, and and happily ever after. And 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 it didn't quite work out that way, as you can imagine, right? <laughs> Being away, of course, has its its challenges on a distance relationship, as it did for us. 
at the same time, I was uh, I was really drawn into this this inner mindset of uh, of of the work focus, and and I was working long, I was working hard, and I began to let the the relationship kind of slide, and not only that, but pretty much all of my personal relationships at the time were kind of pushed aside. And, and, I, and I had that, that inner voice that we sometimes develop. Once I get my business to this point, my income to this mm-hmm. point, things to this point, then I can circle back around and, and reconnect with the important people in my world and all will be good. And we, we tend to repeat that in our mind over and over until it just starts to become a habit and then it becomes an unconscious one and then it becomes an underlying belief and that that's kind of where it was for me well in my in my own story the the relationship that I was in began to to fall apart uh, we were distanced I wasn't coming back home nearly as often as I was early on and and it started to show its wear the stress for each of us was high and and ultimately we broke up and I still had that mindset, though. Once I get this business to this point, then we'll we'll get back together. Things will be okay, and, and you know, happily ever after. And, and we continued to talk, and and you know, we continued to be on a very friendly, uh, you know, very positive level. But it was it was evident that we were we were kind of starting to drift some. Um, and then I got a call one night from a relative of, uh, of my now former girlfriend to tell me that she had passed away suddenly. And wow. she had a, a, a health risk, a health concern that was uh, congenital from before and uh, it had just uh, finally taken its toll. And, and, and I, as you can imagine, it, it hit me kind of like a, like a brick up the side of the head kind of a thing. And, and uh, um, it took a fair, a long time for me to kind of go through that, that grieving process. And ultimately, um, I, I held a lot of guilt about the state of our relationship at the time. I held a lot of guilt about the stress that was there. And it stuck with me. And I ended up essentially falling into this deep, dark place of depression, of, uh, of, uh, not being able to really function the way that I, that I wanted to. I returned back into my work and work became this almost kind of robotic type of a thing for, for quite a long time. I wasn't really living my purpose. I wasn't, you know the work was up and down in terms of our successes, but uh, in time I was I was able to find that that it was really what we were creating there was really my business partner's dream and vision. It wasn't really mine. Mm-hmm. Mine really was more focused around the 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 uh, the illusion of the freedom that I thought we would immediately <laughs> have and the money and everything else. Stayed in that funk for about seven years before I finally uh, I finally uh, began to come out of that. And ultimately it was one of my buddies, one of my best friends that kind of gave me that kick in the butt and said, you got to do something. This isn't you. You're not, you're not your usual self. And, and I hate seeing you like this. And, and so I, I started the long process of beginning to, uh, beginning to shift, beginning to change, beginning to forgive, beginning to move forward. And, and ultimately it began the path to, to where I'm at now. But, uh, uh, it was a long road, and, and and the more I talked with other business owners, the more I began to see that people, they didn't have the same story that I did, uh, and it maybe it didn't involve a relationship, maybe it was around their health, or maybe it was something else, but there was something that, that really um, limited them, and something that uh, that prevented them from being able to live the life that they want, that they love, or even necessarily know or connect with what that is, and uh, therefore their you know their everyday experience was was full of stress or overwhelm or or uh, imbalance or burnout, and 
it began to formulate my own path to change for me, for my life, uh, at the same time that I wanted to help others avoid it, prevent it, uh, or break free from it if they happen to be caught up in it and, and uh, finding those ways to support them to, to see it and, and carve a new way. So I think there's some major inspirational factor there because the people that you probably currently work with and have worked with throughout your coaching career, um, again, it's not just some guy who's read up on a book on how to help me be successful and find it. He's, he's done it himself. He's, he's been in the dark side. He's come through that, worked his way through it. And because of that, I think he's in a better position to be able to help other people through it. And I think that's amazing. So thank you. Just one other quick question about mm-hmm. your business, and it's just tied into your name. Mm-hmm. Now, when I first met Brent, um, he owned a company that I think was called Entrepreneurial Freedom yes. at the time. Yes. And at some point in the last year or two, he went through a bit of a rebranding and name change to this One Wave Life. Yes. You want to just give a brief kind of explanation or just backstory behind that? Yes. Well, <laughs> Entrepreneurial Freedom. Uh, I, I actually I still like the name, but I was finding it was interesting because people were having a hard time saying the word, let alone <laughs> spelling, spelling the it. word. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the freedom piece is is certainly a big part of what I do. It's about helping people achieve and create freedom, so that they can can live, can work, can grow a business, can can do the things that they want in life, the way that they want to. And everybody's going to be unique in that way. One way of life came out of uh, out of a couple of things really. One, uh, my own affinity to to water, to the the ocean, the uh, underwater life, overwater life, and and that kind of stuff. It's just a big part of who I am. But the other part of it is more of a a part of the shift or the transition. And you know, when you think about the struggles that people have, it's an awful lot like you're out in a stormy sea and the waves are crashing down from all different angles on you and and some days you're you feel like you're you're drowning and and other days you feel like your head's just barely above water and you can barely breathe and those waves are hitting from all different areas of one's life and a part of what I'm doing in one wave life is to help people to be able to uh, get their head above water initially, just to be able to breathe, to be able to take a breath, look around, and see the next step that they want to be able to take. After that, it's all about being able to harness the power to rise above those waves crashing all around, and then to ride one wave after another after another towards the calmer waters of an ideal life, a thriving business and uh, you know, the, the happiness that we are looking for, both uh, at work as well as at home and elsewhere. Well, that's pretty amazing. You mentioned an affinity for water. Sometimes I feel like us living in Alberta, maybe we need to yeah. relocate towards the ocean side <laughs> city, but that's okay. Uh, I would invite you, uh, listening or watching, to check out Brent's website, onewavelife.com. You can book a session with him. You can, uh, he has a lot of like support groups and programs and uh, does all sorts of amazing things in his work there. So I invite you guys, if you get a chance, to head over to his website at uh, onewavelife.com and check him out there. Now, when we were trying to figure out what we're going to talk about today, as I mentioned, the, the title of today's podcast episode is called Balancing Your Business. So I'm going to take just a minute and sort of explain the details of the financial side of what that refers to and then we'll dovetail it back into why I think Brent's going to make the perfect guest today. So let's rewind for a second, kind of high level. A business over the course of a a duration, it could be a fiscal year, it could be a quarter, it could just be a financial period, is going to produce what are called financial statements. And those financial statements can be quite lengthy but in like high level summary, we have an item called a balance sheet, uh, so-called because it literally mathematically balances. The top half 
balances out to the same amount as the bottom half. We'll get to that in a second. We have an income statement, sometimes called a profit and loss statement, which tells you how much income or profit or loss that you've made over a period of time. And sometimes people get these two st statements confused. So one way I like to think about this is a balance sheet is sort of a little picture, a little snapshot of what you own or what you have at a moment in time. Uh, for financial statements purposes, we'll say at the very end, at 11.59 p.m. at the end of a certain period, it's what existed at that moment in time, good and bad. Whereas an income statement or profit and loss is going to show you what happened during a period of time and the change that happened and the transactions it created and everything that happened during that time. There's also one called a cash flow statement, which as its name would suggest, would tell you what happened to all your cash. And some people don't care how much it says they make on paper. They want to know why the bank account balance isn't as big as they would like it to be. And sometimes that's their most favorite statement is to look and like, where'd all my money go? It says I made money because I paid tax, but I don't see it in the bank account. So where'd the money go? So that cash flow statement's helpful. And then there's other things. There's footnotes and um, annex things and stuff. But those are kind of the primary ones. Today, we're going to focus on the balance sheet. So let me just explain a little bit what the balance sheet is, why it's called that, and dovetail back into why Brent's here today. So a balance sheet on its surface, as mentioned earlier, is just literally a mathematical balance between assets that a company or business owns and the offsetting side, which are liabilities and equity. And so a balance sheet literally just means that the asset number is exactly equal to the sum of the liabilities and the equity. Ironically, this is probably not a very good name for a financial statement because it may not really matter that much that mathematically these things agree. And so uh, a newer name that these uh, balance sheets come to be known by is often called a statement of financial position, which makes sense. Again, it's a little snapshot of what you have at a moment in time and would probably accurately reflect to some degree you know, your, uh, your financial position at a moment in time. But the thing is, is I want to go back to this concept of a balance sheet. So it's still called that because our assets should be equal to our liabilities and our equity. Um, not dissimilar, actually, from how a bank might look at you. If you were to approach a bank for financing, they're actually going to do a bit of a balancing act themselves, and they're going to look at something called your debt to equity ratio. And effectively, what that tells them is this company exists. Now, it either exists because it's profitable or it exists because it's highly in debt, or perhaps it's got a good balance of the two. And so they'll look at that debt to equity ratio, and if they're gonna extend you more debt, they wanna know that you have enough equity to kind of balance things out. So if you look at a balance sheet, in theory, it will give you some idea of how well balanced that business is. And so let's make, bring this home. When you're running your business, you would want to look at your balance sheet on a pretty regular basis because it's going to give you some idea of how well your business is balanced, how much of your business is functioning because it's in debt. And I know we tend not to like debt, and I'm not encouraging it, but it's almost a necessary thing in a lot of businesses. And how much of your business is being financed by equity, and how does that compare to what you have as actual assets? So balance sheet would be a good thing to look at. Now, if we can get a tangible document to show us how balanced our business is, and a bank can use that to look at how balanced our, or leveraged we are, then what if there was a way that we could get a tangible document or go through an activity or exercise that would help us know how balanced our business is in relation to the other areas of our life? Now, that's where I think Brent is gonna be a great person to have today. As Brent mentioned, as we talked about already, he is an ideal life architect, a little bit different than the typical business coach because his goal is not just to help you have a successful business, but to keep all things in balance with the rest of the things that are important to you. Now, sometimes we tend to think of balance as literally just being equal, like 50-50. But I think everyone's gonna have a little bit different priorities as to what they find balance is to them. Some people like working. Some people like working a lot, and to them, balance isn't necessarily 50% of the time is work and 50% is not work. It's I'm doing what I love doing in the priority I have in the amount of times I want to be doing it in. And so again, I look forward to kind of learning more about this. Brent, what would you say to all that? Where do you want to take this? Well, I think we 
maybe begin right with that concept of uh, balance being equal. Right? When you talk about a balance sheet and you've got uh, one side equals the other side, well, when we think about it from a work-life balance perspective, a lot of people think that that is how it is supposed to be, and, and it never will be. And unfortunately then, that's where the myth of work-life balance kind of tends to come out where people say, well, ah, it's just a myth. It can't be, it can't be achieved, so why bother starting down the road in the first place? And people do, unfortunately, not even bother looking into it because it's just something else that can't work. So why bother starting? I'll just keep doing whatever I'm doing, even if it's not necessarily working with me or for me in the way that it ought to. There's the the term work-life balance. I like it. It's a recognizable one. We know it. Other people will use terms, and, and there's some of these that I really like as well. So, for instance, work-life harmony. Mm. Being okay. able to create more of a uh, a space or a feeling of harmony in all aspects, all areas of our life. Another one is work-life flow, where things just seem to flow in a very positive, effective way. It's different for you than it is for me than it is for the next person. And however we choose to define it or describe it, I think the thing that we do need to understand is that it is unique and it is different for every single person out there. And, and like you said, there's people that uh, are focused at this particular point anyways, in terms of their business uh, uh, growth and their business uh, where it's at, that they love doing the work that they're doing. And, and part of that stress is because they have to do all this other stuff that they wish they didn't have to do. <laughs> and if they could just focus on these things, they might spend a lot of their time, a majority of their time. Maybe they, maybe they don't have a family. Maybe they uh, are, uh, you know, their health is, is where it, they want and need it to be and everything else seems to be in check and working an awful lot. That's a great level of balance. And you can think of the other end of the spectrum and the person who would just love to have more freedom and time to spend with their young family or to spend focused on being active and being, and taking care of their health or, 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 or traveling or recreation or whatever it is that's important to them. And that balance is probably going to mean that they're not working as much as somebody else. But if they can arrange that and still be successful in terms of their business, still be financially uh, at a point where they are earning what they want, what they need, and creating that, well, then that's their version of balance. So at the, at the end of the day, it's how you define it and then how you live it and how it helps you to live the life and the lifestyle that you want, including having the business the way that you want it to be. I think that must make the work you do more exciting then because it's not a cookie-cutter approach. It's not a it isn't. every every client that comes needs exactly this, and I know how to help them with this magic formula. It's I'm going to listen to what is important to you, yeah. What you would find a good use of your priorities, and then I'm going to help you come up with a custom program methodology to help you achieve that. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so that all sounds great, and I think I'm going to be jumping the gun here, but people listening are going to be like, okay. So we've got this guy on who says that he can help me get this perfect balance of what I want out of my life, including this where this new business venture fits in. But how? Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that's coming a little premature um, is to jump right into the how now. But what would you think would be a good segue into getting to the how? Because I think that would be a crucial thing that people listening want to know. Yeah. Um, before the how there definitely is a, a few steps to begin with. And, and one of them, and we've already been kind of alluding to it, is the why. Okay, talk why, us through the why. You know, why. Why should I bother? Why, is, why do I need to change? Why do I need to create this thing that you call work-life balance? And the important part of that one, I think, is because I can create a plan, a program, and hand it over and say, here you go, just do this, and you will have balance. Just like New Year's resolution time. <laughs> I was gonna bring here that is up. your exercise program, follow <laughs> this, or your nutrition program, follow this. 
and you will lose weight, you will get in better shape, you will, you know, whatever it happens to be. The, and, and we do so, we start, we're excited, we're motivated, and we begin down that path, and then we start to slide from it, we start to drift from it. Life starts to get in the way urgencies and priorities and everything else that's going on in our in our day-to-day existence both at work and away from work starts to take over and i think that uh, without a deep enough strong enough compelling enough why it will win out you know those urgencies and everything will win out every single time mm-hmm eventually they will knock us off course. We need something that we can hold on to, that we can see, that we can visualize, that we can check back in with, that we can align with when at those times when we need it most, right? When stress is raising the highest and when we're feeling the least energetic, most fatigued, most overwhelmed, uh, stepping into burnout perhaps, that's when we need that deep understanding of our why. And, and just like how we create balance, why is also something that is very unique to each and every one of us. Mm-hmm. And it's not for me or for you to say, well, your why should be A, B, or C. We need to be able to discover that and, and spend some time really connecting on, on what really matters to us. Now, when I hear you say that, this is a, I'm going to reference a book that I've referenced before on this show, and it's one that's kind of become very personal meaning to me. Uh, it's by a gentleman named Simon Sinek. Uh, his book is called Start With Why, based on a highly popular TED Talk that he gave many years ago. Um, there's a phrase in there that I've quoted on the show before, but I'm going to bring it up again because I think it ties into what you said. He says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I've always looked at that up until a moment ago as when we run a business, we need to make sure our customers, our clients know why we exist because they care more about why we exist than what it is that we do. But in light of what you just said, I'm almost thinking it might be helpful to look at Mr. Sinek's comment in lieu of me being the business owner, as in I'm not going to be able to stick with what I'm doing until I believe or buy into why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I'm going through those hard moments, when I'm going through those moments where I just want to give up because it's hard and it's going to come, it'd be foolish to me to think that it's always going to be fun. There's going to be hard days. There's going to be hard moments. There's going to be rough times. And if I don't know why I'm doing it, it's not going to take too many of those rough times to be like, you know what? I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. Right? So the why is not only for a client of a business. I think for the business owner, they need to understand their own why because that's what's going to get them through um, a lot more than the what. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so many things, there's so many <clears throat> influencers out there in our world that if we don't have some clarity of, of our why, and, and this does speak both at work as well as away from work, and, and usually it's even at, a, at a, you know, a step up higher level than that that applies across the board from a business owner's perspective, um, we can fall victim, if you will, to to those pressures and to those influences. And uh, uh, one of the things that I, I utilize myself and, and that I do with many of my clients is we create something that I call the ideal life compass. Okay. Right? So you think about a compass, and a compass is meant to kind of guide you and, and keep you on track with the direction that you want to go. And like I said, if you have the plan, we can be following the plan. But if we are following the, the, the plan, the, the strategy, the step-by-step process, but we're actually taking it in the wrong direction and we're, you know, head down, blinders on, efficiently, effectively working as hard as we possibly can and we stop and we pause and we look up and realize that we've been going in the wrong well direction. off on a tangent then there's a whole lot of time, a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of frustration to bring us back on course. So when we have a guiding light, if you will, um, the, a, a, a compass, something to align with that can apply both in your, uh, in your working world as well as your, your personal world, 
it's, it's going to allow you to make decisions based on whether or not they align, to be able to um, take steps, actionable steps, again, based up on whether or not that they align. And if we continue to stay aligned as best we can, we know that we're going to be able to take our business and take our life in the direction that we want to go. It's not a destination that we're necessarily aiming for, but it is more of a direction and, and things will happen you know, a, a day, a week, a month, a year from now that we can't foresee right now. But if it's based and anchored in things that are important to us, our why, then we know that all the little ebbs and flows, all the little course corrections and changes are going to keep us staying along that line. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. One of the thoughts I was wondering, I'd love for you to answer, is I can just picture people who are listening saying, well, I, I know my why, like it's possibly why I started the business, it's possibly why I'm doing all this, because I see my why at home with my wife or kids or spouse or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But it's always up here. I'm going to assume, perhaps incorrectly, but it would be beneficial to take the time and energy to craft that why into a written form. Is, would you agree? Is that is that yeah, an important concept? Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, that's a, a good assumption that you make in that respect, because if we even if we go through a process of writing it out, crafting it, and having it on a piece of paper or on the computer, and then we just file it away in a folder or in a in a desk drawer, and we never really look at it. It's uh, it's gonna again be quickly um, overwhelmed by by all of our day to day uh, life and work urgencies and tasks and steps and things that we're doing all the time, such that we kind of forget about it. So not only do we need to create it, but we need to we need to utilize it in in an effective way, and we can do that. By, for instance, if we have a, a morning routine that we start our day with, one of those steps as a part of the morning routine can be to read and reflect on our why. Mm. And suggestion. when I, uh, in terms of that ideal life compass that I've mentioned, there's really three kind of component areas to that that I, that I have. One is our core values and getting in... Uh, a clear connection with, a clear uh, uh, identification of what our personal core values are. A second one is our underlying sense of purpose, a deeper sense of purpose. And often we think of purpose and we can, we can create for our business a you know, purpose statement, a mission mm -hmm. statement, uh, things like that. And they, they often speak uh, thing, uh, in a very kind of a broad sometimes very vague sense, but I think what needs to happen for a business owner is that we need to have a purpose statement, an underlying sense of purpose that is more than our business, that is really speaking to who and how we are, the impact that we want to make on the world, the mark that we want to make, the, the, uh, the legacy that we want to leave, the, things like that such that if our business was taken away, we sell it, or it goes bankrupt, or we're in a career and we quit, or we get fired, or we get laid off, or we retire. Now what? How do we, you know, what do we do next? And when we have a clear idea of what that sense of purpose is, now we can use it to decide the direction we take our business, how we run our business, how big we want to make our business, where we have our, all those kinds of things that kind of go along with that, but it also speaks away from it as well. And then that goes into the third part, which is your vision. Hmm. Your, you know, your longer term vision of and this is really is speaking to the direction that you want to live and lead. Uh, what is the life and lifestyle that I want to live? What is the impact I want to make in doing the work that I'm doing in the company that I, that I own? And when we have all of those three aligned and we have them, in a written out manner, in a 
a way that is written that is compelling, inspiring, and motivating, and we read that to ourselves out loud, however we want, on a day-to-day -day basis, say first thing in the morning as a part of a wake-up routine, it acts as an affirmation. It just it, it reminds us every single day, this is what I'm getting up and getting out there and going and doing. And if it's predominantly focused around work, okay, that's a part of our balance. Or if it's doing the work that we're doing because we know that it's ultimately going to lead to the freedom so that we can also live the life and lifestyle we want away from work, great. That's what the balance is for, for another person. But that's, I think, one, one powerful way that we can do that is, is that morning uh, that morning affirmation, that morning uh, energize, uh, get your day going process. Hmm. I've never actually considered doing that before. Like, uh, I've I've talked to many people who have like daily affirmations that they would say. Uh, I've never connected the idea of making a morning routine with affirmations, like tying into your like business purpose and just sort of your overall life's goals and purpose. So. Yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Um, now, this is probably the million dollar question. I think we've talked a little bit around it, but maybe if we can just sort of wrap this one up nicely in a bow for a second. Yeah. In your opinion, of which I personally would value greatly because of what you spend your career doing, why do you think people struggle so much to have this balance, this, uh, we called it a myth, sometimes of a work-life balance, but we've defined it a bit, but what, what do you think is one of the leading causes or some of the leading causes of, of that? Why people struggle so much with that? Um, one of them, I think, is because sometimes it feels unachievable and or it feels that it's so far out there that it would take so much effort, so much work, to get there that I just don't have it within me and 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 not now right it's one of those things that I think people have that that inner dialogue that says once you know once I get to this point then I can start to think about creating work life balance and uh, I, and I've heard that a lot I bet you have. where uh, two things that people tend to struggle with right off the start one is a lack of time and the other one is a lack of direction uh, or vision, which is a part of this ideal life compass, which is a part of our why. And when we don't have clarity of the direction we're going, then we're, we tend to fall victim to simply doing what we think needs to be done, the day-to-day -day things, or uh, waiting until it sort of drops in our lap uh, as opposed to making it happen for ourselves. And then the other one in terms of time, and that's you know, the age old, once I have more time, then I can. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start working on how to create more time and more freedom, we'll never get more time and more freedom because the carrot always will dangle a little beyond our, our reach. And as soon as we start to get close to something, as soon as we get close to a goal uh, or a point of maybe some more freedom or some more balance, well, something else now comes in to take its place and it pushes it out there a little bit more and 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 never seems to arrive it seems to be able to arrive i should say can, can i read a quote to you seems a little bit relevant mm -hmm. uh, i don't know who this lady is but it makes me want to learn about her because this quote just really hits home to me uh, it's by a lady named betsy jacobson here's what she says balance is not better time management but better boundary management balance means making choices and enjoying those choices. Yeah. Now, you, you, you already said it, and I've heard many people say it, and I'm guilty of saying it all the time too. If I only had more time, then <laughs> I would. Yeah. Or sometimes I'm like, if the Beatles were correct and I had eight days a week, right? <laughs> think how much more I could get done. That time is, I think, is the great equalizer that separates the, like, the billion dollar business moguls of the world to us, we all are still working in the same time constraint. Yeah. So I don't yeah. think it's time that is really the problem. And obviously we can't create more time. No. So how do you feel about that? It's what we do with the time. How do we how do we prioritize? Right? We from a business owner's perspective, 
we have so many things on the go and everything feels like a priority and if we just you know use the the adage of well just focus on your priorities well there's still too many for 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week and it comes down to urgency is taking over and I mentioned that a little bit earlier where when we think about things like our vision that we want for our life we think about the values that we hold to be true a sense of purpose that kind of stuff we think about our whys they are important but they're not necessarily urgent and because of that when push comes to shove the urgent stuff tends to bump the important stuff mm-hmm. from our calendar mm-hmm. and you know we we've, we've uh, We've heard that before. We've seen that before. We, I'm, I'm sure everybody's experienced it. You go back to this, the New Year's resolution in terms of exercise or or uh, eating healthier, and the exercise one especially. We start off and we put it into our calendar five days a week for an hour or half an hour, whatever that time is that we're going to do, and. Next thing you know, there's an urgent meeting, there's a deadline on something, there's, you know, or there's something in another part of our world. And what do we bump? Well, we bump that because, oh, I can just do that tomorrow. And then tomorrow we bump it again and then, we, mm-hmm. and then the slide begins. So it, uh, it, it, it leads to the, the, the need to look at how, and, and you mentioned earlier, okay, how do we start to get to this point? Well, I think once we understand our why, then we need to understand sort of the what, right? What is our current reality? Where are we at with that? Before we can really step to the to the how, and a, a, a part of the how that we're already beginning to, to check into here is around boundaries, is around priorities, is around making clear and conscious decisions of what we do with our 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not eight days a week like the Beatles would like us to believe or hope (laughs) for. Um, But how can we get it to all fit? Million dollar question. Well, I'm reminded of a little demo that uh, I saw Stephen Covey uh, do I think I've seen it done in multiple variety of ways, but a particular video clip I remember him doing where he invited this lady, it was sort of an object lesson, and she had to cram all of this stuff into like a, I'll call it like a vase or whatever. Yeah. And she had big rocks and then smaller rocks and then tiny rocks and then sand. And um, when she was focusing on putting the sand in first and the small stuff in first, which is what we tend to do in in life, is those little quick fires that we were trying to do were the the easier ones. she couldn't fit. There wasn't room enough to fit the, all all the important things, the bigger stuff. Yeah. Um, if she's focused on putting the the smaller stuff in first, mm-hmm. and only when she flipped that on its head and put the most important rocks, the biggest rocks in first, was she able to then find time and space to be able to put in all the little things because they just have the sand fills in the crevices nicely yep. when you have the foundation there. Yeah. Um, So that's an object lesson. Many of us have probably seen something similar to that. Now, Stephen Covey actually also has a uh, time management matrix that he mentions in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where he dives directly into what you just talked about, where he he takes this concept of urgency and, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Urgency and importance. Importance and creates a four quadrant matrix out of it Mm -hmm. and invites us to spend most of our time when we can in quadrant two, which is what you described as things that are rarely urgent, but extremely important. Mm -hmm. And because we're often finding ourselves as business owners or just people putting out the fires, we never get time for the important stuff because we're always addressing urgent stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming in your role as a coach to your clients and just in general, whether it's Stephen Covey's Matrix or a variety of other tools, what are some practical application tools or uh, things that you would have your clients utilize to help them in getting to those important but 
rarely urgent matters. Yeah, that uh, that is a, a good way of looking at it, and and I, I love that book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective mm-hmm. People. That's it's probably one of the first ones that I read, uh, even before the story that I shared about myself earlier, way, way, way back in the day. And I still draw upon so many of the lessons from it. And, and that one that you just described is a powerful one because what it suggests and what we really, I think, need to do is when we do our, uh, when we do our planning in one form or another, we need to start with the boulders and then progress ourselves towards the sand and the water at the very end. And I think that still is a mistake that a lot of people do, is that we do it in reverse order. Mm-hmm. And we wonder why we never have enough time. Uh, I had worked with a, a client once, and one of their challenges was their calendar is over full. And they opened up their digital calendar on the screen, and it was just this myriad of colors and, <laughs> and you know double, triple booking and all those sort of things that were in there. And it was kind of a, wow, okay, where do we begin with this? So, And... One of the the steps, uh, maybe we'll even kind of backtrack a little bit here. One of the steps I think we need to understand at the start is is what needs to go into our calendar, and uh, and why, of course, because when we think about our calendar and we lose control of it, is when we when we do this approach of the the sand and the water, and we fill it up with all of the appointments and little steps and the urgencies and other people's urgencies and there really is nothing left in terms of blocks of time. So when we start with really assessing our current reality and beginning to start to look at not just our work reality because that's what we also tend to do as business owners, right? We, we think when we assess this, well, there's, there's this department in my business and this department in this department and there's these tasks and there's these deadlines and there's these meetings and it might feel like I'm putting in the important ones, the boulders, and onward towards the, 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 the sand and, and the water and it completely fills my schedule. And then I start to think about, oh, and my kids got their volleyball tournament this night and I was going to do some workouts uh, in my home gym on the treadmill and, oh, we talked about maybe my spouse and I going out for dinner. Hmm, you know, maybe next week, right? (laughs) So it becomes, I think, a need to really start to look at where am I on track? Where am I off track right now? In my whole life, including in my business. And when we start to see that, then we can um, determine where we maybe need to put more of a conscious effort in order to start to create a little more balance. So if we start to see that where I'm dropping the ball all the time is my personal health and well-being. My sleep is off track and and I'm somewhat sleep deprived which has an impact on my uh, on my energy through the day and therefore it's diminishing my ability to focus on my productivity that's not good we you know might look at that and say um, I had good intention in order to work out three times a week for a half an hour each time but I'm averaging maybe one day a week that's not so good either and and I, I, I see that, for instance, saying, okay, that's an area where I think I need to improve. If I improve that, it will have an overall impact in a very positive sense. And it's a part of how I want to be able to live the life and lifestyle that's important to me. Not to mention the fact of the health impact that it will have from a, a standpoint of being healthier and living longer. Well, like it or not, those are all integrated. <laughs> Absolutely, they are. If we're right. not physically healthy, we're yeah. gonna, it's going to trickle into other areas. Absolutely. And, and that's just one particular area and we can and and we can look at a number of those and I've developed something that I call the seven waves of real success okay and we think about success and, and again once again we look at it usually from the standpoint of financial success and career or business success and and that the, those kind of tend to go hand in hand but I think we need to look at it 
beyond that in a bigger, broader sense. And therefore, each of these seven waves represents a different area in our world, in our lives. And any one of them off track has the ability to knock other ones off track and have a negative impact on them. On the flip side, as we attend to and address any one of them, it can also have a positive benefit towards the other ones. So they are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. Just as we were talking for a minute there, just about the health-related one of them. So um, each of them, so the first one is, uh, wave number one is, is meaning, living a life of meaning. And that circles back around to that idea life compass and talking about things like values, purpose, and vision, and direction, and where you want to be going with your life. Are we on track or off track in understanding how clear we are with, with uh, our, our sense of meaning, what matters, and are we not only clear about it, but are we actually living in alignment with it? Second wave is mindset. Do we have a healthy, positive mindset that is going to permeate through all of these other waves and lead to us being able to stay aligned and stay on track? Or do we have a poisonous inner voice that creates self-doubt or lack of confidence or negativity towards various types of things and, and how that can have an impact? Third one, contribution. This is the one that speaks to our work, right? It speaks to how we make a difference, how we make an impact, how we uh, support the clients that we work with, how we succeed in operating the business that we have or the career that we're in, and make a difference in the lives of those that we reach. Now, this isn't only about work. So from a business owner's perspective, this is working in your business, delivering to those that you work with. It's about working on your business to be able to have it grow and, and develop and evolve. But away from your business, this could involve community work, for instance, mm. where we're giving of our skills, our time and our energy to make a difference in those that we reach. And, and for some people, that's a very important thing, and that's great. So contribution becomes the third wave. The fourth and the fifth wave are around our self-care. Fifth or fourth wave, sorry, is vitality. And vitality is all about um, adding life to our years and the way that we do that through the way that we take care of ourselves healthy eating nutrition uh, exercise lowering stress better sleep and and maybe recreation sport the kind of things that we do that keep ourselves a physically active lifestyle important uh, in its own right sixth wave is longevity so if vitality is adding life to your years, longevity, longevity is adding years to your life, the things that we do to assess our health and well-being, to take the steps that we need to in terms of rehabilitation or, uh, or therapies to make sure we're taking care of our bodies so that we can live a long, healthy life. Wave number six, connection. It's all about people. It's mm -hmm. about the people in our world, uh, our, our people at home, spouse if we're if we if we have one our kids if we have them our closest family and friends the business partner or our work colleagues or team or employees all the important people in our world uh, including our clients as well of course the depth of our interaction with them and the quality of the interactions that we have are we addressing those in a way that works for us, that takes us in the direction of the vision that we want to live and the impact that we want to make. And then the seventh wave, money. And we leave money as the seventh wave for a very specific reason, because for many of us, we tend to have it as our sole purpose. Mm -hmm. And the, our money, our work, the, the, the business or the career that we have, and then we forget about the rest. But if we attend to those first six, I think that we position ourselves to be able to actually work more effectively, more productively, and earn more, whether it's an individual 
the owner and the impact in their business or as it carries through to their entire organization as, as far as say being the role model the influence on others and the money naturally starts to flow mm-hmm. more effectively than it were, would otherwise so taking care of those first six both would potentially naturally on its own help you with number seven with the money yeah and maybe along with that though is if number seven doesn't go the way you hope you start a business venture or you have a job or whatever and you just picture this things continuing to go grand and then they don't. Mm-hmm. If you have those first six things sorted out, I think you're in a better position to deal with negative number sevens that come along. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're you're absolutely right there, and and uh, just like your perspective on it changes. Yeah, well, and these are when we look at these, and I. I look at these with the, the, the people that I work with in the sense of, of assessing each one of them, and each one of them I actually break them down a little bit more in terms of the, the overall thing is about a 20-point assessment. An assessment is simply a, it, it's a picture, a moment in time. It's like this balance sheet we were talking about, but just, for your life. Just like the balance sheet, but for your life. Yeah. And what you do with that picture at that moment in time what you understand from it, what you draw from it, what you like about it, what you don't like about it, that leads into the how and what we need to change in order to actually achieve a better sense of balance and better success overall because of it. And I call it the seven waves of real success because when we attend to all seven of them, like you said earlier, each impacts and interrelates with the other ones that that's when we can start to uh, achieve a level of success overall in our world at home and at work and beyond to the level that we want to the level that we like and 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 really it all starts with one simple simple question are you happy and when you think about it in, in each of those seven waves It's kind of what you're asking. Are you happy with your vitality, your your health and your well-being? Yes, no. And even if it is a yes, it might be okay. Well, are are you happy with all aspects of it? It could be a qualified yes. Right. Um, Well, I'm happy with the exercise I've been doing, but I'm not so happy with the way I've been eating lately. Okay. How can we now change to improve that? Are you happy with money? Yeah, I'm earning a lot of money. But I'd always like to earn more. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Or, no, I'm not happy with that. Uh, And and then you dive a little bit deeper in terms of of the why and what needs to start to happen about that. Contribution around our work. Are you happy with the the type of contribution you're making in the level? Well, and and I've I've seen a lot of people that are a solopreneur or... um, a small business that they maybe that there's there's you know, one or two or three employees. Think of tradespeople very often in this respect. Where are you happy with the work that you're doing? And one person says, "I wish I could be on the tools more. I just love doing the work that I'm doing, and I have to do all of this other business stuff of invoicing and." chasing people down to collect money and put in quotes and all these other things, right? I, w- I wish I didn't have to do all of that, okay? So how do we start to approach toward that? Then you ask another tradesperson, very same profession, similar size of business and all, and they say, I'm just tired of all the work I have to do on the tools. I wish I didn't have to do that anymore. I want to, I want to build my business. I want to uh, focus on growing my business and getting it to a next level. I want to build an empire. Both are absolutely right for themselves, but yet very different from terms of what they need to focus on and what they need to work on. So it gives that insight to help you understand um, what some of those steps of change need to be moving forward as you look at gaining control of your calendar and actually planning out where you go from there. The big rocks, right? Those ones become the big rocks of, of change over the next period of time. So this assessment you refer to, we're going to refer to it a little bit as the the balance sheet for your life because I love that kind of analogy. Mm -hmm. Um, This is not a one-time thing, 
right? I mean, starting, crucial, but it's yeah. probably not as effective, like you mentioned earlier, if you just do something and stick it in your drawer and never look at it again. So you've got yeah. this document, this assessment of where you are in these areas that you've mentioned. Yeah. But doing it once is not enough. I'm, how, how often should uh, someone sit down and have this kind of real assessment of themselves? Like how often should that be done? Uh, my uh, my opinion is at least once per quarter. Okay. And then certainly maybe even a bigger, more uh, more comprehensive one at year end. You know whether it be a fiscal year end because that's the way that you want to look at it, or a calendar year end and and take the next year ahead. But um, of course, things change, and hopefully we grow in a positive direction, so that three months from now when you assess all the seven waves and you look at where things are at, several things are moving along the way that you want them to be. And maybe that assessment allows you to look at that and say, okay, now I want to take it to the next level, whatever the next level is. On the other hand, you might three months later look at it and go, oh, uh, I had good intentions of working on this. Didn't work out so well stories or excuses maybe can come up at that particular moment as to why or maybe there's some some very legitimate reasons why it was kind of pushed off and shelved for the time being and it allows you an opportunity again to just check in it's another snapshot at another point in time to say yeah this is still a it's still important to me and things have changed a little bit now and I can approach this a little differently because of A, B, and C. We're going to double down and, and focus on it now for the next quarter. On the other hand, you might look at it and say, yeah, you know, three months ago I thought this was important and things have changed and it's not so important anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just leave that be for now and I'm okay with it. And there is no absolute right or wrong to this process. It's just a process of allowing you to take that next snapshot and seeing where you're at and making some decisions based on that, on, on terms of how you want to act and, and where you want to go. And would part of your role as a coach, for example, if a client was, you're working with a client through, was working through this process, part of your role as a, a coach would be to both encourage as well as hold accountable? Is that the yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Because... Um, uh, we always want to encourage, you know, and, and, and individuals, people, us, we tend to focus on what isn't done mm -hmm. or the negative things first or what has still yet to be done. And then when we actually accomplish something, even something that might be big, we just kind of push it off. Okay, I'm done. Next. What, you know, what now? And, and I think it's important because we talked about the compelling whys earlier. Mm -hmm. If we don't celebrate our successes, even the small ones, we, we can really stay caught up in those urgencies, the, you know, the water and the sand getting into the calendar as opposed to the big, bolder, important things, and not make a whole lot of progress moving forward. So yeah, we, we um, a part of my role, but I think a, a person can do this quite well on their own also is just to remember to celebrate the small things. And then there's the accountability side of it, of course. And the accountability side is to help one stay aligned and stay on track and to actually do what you say you need to do, you want to do based upon the assessment and, and what you want to change. And when you're not doing it to take a moment to stop and, and step back and look at why okay what's going on here and and that's a part of the power of of the ongoing coaching support again it can be it can be coaching support from someone like myself it can also be something that a person has an accountability buddy someone that is on a similar path to them and you just agree to check in with once in a, with one another, say you know once a week or, or whatever time frame you want, just to just to have that conversation. And and more often than not, it's it's less about what the other person says. It's more about what you're bringing to the conversation, saying, 
all right, I said I was going to do this. I didn't do it. <laughs> and and then, you know, it's like you're catching yourself and holding yourself accountable, but the other person helps to make it more focused and real. Real, yeah. Um, but that, that piece of it does become vital because there's... Uh, essentially three things that'll pull us off track once we have the programs set, once we have the, the plan set for ourselves. There are um, old habits and patterns that will keep us doing the same thing that we've always done because that's just the way that we've always done it. And they become unconscious at, at some point in time such that we don't necessarily think that we're doing them, but we're doing them. And if we're trying or needing to change an old habit, right? Think of, say, the, come back to this, the exercise analogy, the snooze button on the alarm. <laughs> if our old habit is to have the alarm go off at 6.30 in the morning, and then we hit the snooze button three times, we don't actually get out of bed until 7.15, 7.30, and yet a part of our plan, our new plan moving forward, is to get up a little earlier to do this morning routine that might include the ideal life compass or re reconnecting with our vision or direction or why. Our old habit is going to want to have us continue to hit that snooze button until we find a way to break free from it. Sometimes, again, we can do it on our own. Sometimes we need the support of someone like a coach to do so. We've also got our deep underlying beliefs. We all have a belief system. And a belief system that we have learned from when we were really, really small. And many influencers along the way who have helped to formulate that belief system. Some of those beliefs are very positive. They serve us. They support us. And we ought to continue to hold them close and align with them. But we also formulate beliefs that limit us. And they may have started off as something innocently enough and become something that limits us. They no longer serve us and we need to shift and change away from that. Or they can sometimes have come from a significant event in in our in our our previous uh, time in our maybe as a child or maybe at some point in our life along the way, and we have internalized them in a way that uh, that limits us. And of course, over time, they also become unconscious and they just dictate. That's our inner voice chirping at us. And if again we do an assessment and we decide that we want to do something different. And it's, let's say for instance, that we want to take our business to a next level. And we know that in doing so, it's going to require taking some calculated risks. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to make a commitment to taking these changes and stepping up to them. But at some point, maybe we learned from someone in our past that it's better to play it safe. Don't take a risk because you're just going to get burned. And it's become a part of who and how we are to the point that it's unconsciously there. We don't even realize it's happening. So now when I'm considering taking this step to take my business to a next level, that inner voice is going to be chirping at me all along. Yeah, but don't do this step because you know that that's likely to fail or be careful over here because you know that this is mm -hmm. going to happen this way. We don't hear it in words like that. We hear it more just around the emotion that kind of fills in around it. And the inner voice might be chirping, but it might prevent us from taking a step. It might limit us from how we just go for it or something else. And ultimately, we, you know, we don't get to where we want to go. So we need help to be able to not only identify and see these underlying beliefs, but also be able to start to shift and break free from them when we have our, you know, a plan in place that's going to go anything different than the way that it has been. That old, that old underlying voice, it's like a, 
it's like a uh, the analogy I like to use in, in breaking free from the limiting belief is like playing the whack-a-mole game when you're going to the <laughs> to the carnival, right? We know the whack-a-mole game where the, the mole pops its head up and you smack it down with the hammer and then it pops up over there and you smack it down, then it pops up over there and you smack it down. Every time that you knock down that limiting belief, which is one of those moles, it stays strong, wants to stay strong, and it pops up over here in a slightly different way differently worded, different effect, different example or event in our work or in our life, and we have to see it and then knock that one down. And then it pops up over there. And it wants to stay alive. It wants to stay in control of, of, of our way of being because that's the way that it's always been and that's what's felt safe. So we got to knock it down over and over and over again until we, until we weaken it to the point where we can move forward the way that we want. And sometimes we can do it ourselves. Sometimes we need the extra help to do so. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. I think we've talked about a lot of good things today. We've talked about the need to find a why. We've talked about why people struggle with this work-life balance concept and that it, it's okay that it means different things to different people. We've talked about several different ways that you usually will invite people to assess and then asking yourself the question, are you happy in each of these areas? And once you have that assessment, you can create a plan. We just finished talking about the kind of the things that creep up and help kind of derail us from the really good intention plans that we have um, I think we're probably at a good point to wrap up here shortly I want to just share a couple of quick personal thoughts and then some quotes and then sort of leave you to kind of fi finish off with anything kind of final sure. words that you may like to empower with the people listening today okay uh, the two personal things I want to share with quick so I I don't know if I'd say that I take too much vacation but I often get questioned by people um, when they find out that I run a business, especially I run an accounting firm. Um, you, why do you take vacation? Or what? Uh, how dare you that. take vacation? Or <laughs> entrepreneurs aren't allowed to take vacation? Or yeah. don't you know that that's something you give up when you run your own business? And I'm yeah. like, well, I wouldn't want to run my own business if it meant that I could never go enjoy the aspects of life that I love. And so I found it interesting how many times though people ask that question, you're on a vacation, but you run a business, those things in their mind don't, like they're not compatible. Yeah. And then kind of going along with that though, and we talked about New Year's resolutions, one of my goals, and I've calendared it in, so I know what better chance it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. is when my kids have a day off of school this year, in 2024, my goal is to have that same day off of work. Love it. Now, I know already <laughs> the challenge that's going to create because my three busiest months of the year are tax season, which is February, March, and April, yeah. which falls right around Easter and spring break. Yeah. And so for me to take a week off of work right in the middle of my busiest season would seem ludicrous to me. I don't yet know how, how it's all going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying my best to calendar in those big, important boulders and trust that they'll find time to put the rocks and the sand and stuff yeah. in afterwards. Yeah. So that's me trying to practically apply something that's important to me. Because as much as I love my business and I'm so grateful for our clients and everything else, my family will trump it every time. Yeah. And I've always felt bad. I'm like, why do you run your own business if you can't even take a day off to be with your family? <laughs> it's, something's a little wrong here. So I've been trying to uh, realign that. So it is possible, regardless of what industry people work in, regardless of what kind of business they run, even if they're just a one-person show, yeah. again, you got to go back to what Brent said. you got to schedule in those most important priorities and the time allotments that are most important to you and run your business to fit that lifestyle instead of trying to adjust your lifestyle to fit the business you think you got to run. In closing, I want to share a couple of uh, quotes, and then I'll turn some closing time over to Brent. So... Um, I, I try to look up quotes on work-life balance. I love quotes, um, even if I don't know who some of these people are, just some of the things they say really help me think about things differently. I know one of these quotes I'm going to end with is one that really spoke to you when we talked about this before our recording today. Mm -hmm. Let me just read a couple of these others. You can't do a good job if your job is all you do. And that's by a lady named Katie Thurms. Nice. Um, I like this one too, and we've all heard this one. I didn't know it was attributed to Dolly Parton. Maybe it's uh, attributable to multiple people. 
It says, never get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. Yeah. That's a powerful one. And uh, actually, my brother-in-law is really good at reminding me of that. I've like he's a he's a counselor, uh, like a therapist, and um, I've often asked him if he enjoys his work. He's like, well, I enjoy my work, but I have my work so that I can enjoy my life. Yeah. Um, and I, I've yeah. always appreciated that approach. And then ending with this one from Zig Ziglar that you really liked, and if you want to add to it, I'll feel free. It says I believe that being successful means having a balance of success stories across the many areas of your life. You can't truly be considered successful in your business life if your home life is in shambles. So Brent, with that in mind, where do you want to kind of close us out today? Yeah, that, that quote is, yeah, I love that because it kind of speaks to that concept of real success and that real success is beyond uh, just the money, beyond the business. It's your whole life. And it is something that is is unique and different to everyone. And it, and it, and it comes down to that why. And uh, thank you for sharing as you did. And, and you said that in people hearing that you take a vacation or that you take a lot of vacation time or days off or whatever that looks like, and it puzzles them and it surprises them. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's because I think a lot of people are so blindly caught up in that ideal of what should be that it becomes unconscious and it just drives the, well, business owners are supposed to work all the time. Business owners are not supposed to take time off. And and it's just a foreign thing when someone says that they take time off, that they that they uh, they look at it from the standpoint of that just doesn't compute, right? Yet when you do take time off, and I'm getting the sense of that from, from what you're saying here, you not only do you enjoy it because a bigger part of your why is uh, is your family and time you spend with them and the things that you're doing, but you probably come back recharged, more energized, very and actually so. more effective in the work that you do. Very much so. Yeah, and that's and that's an important piece I think that we that we can try to remember because another one of those pieces that I think a lot of people get caught up in is the either or mindset, and it's kind of that it's the pendulum swing. I can take time off, be with my family, do the things I like to do, or whatever that is. Or I can be at work and I'm focused on making money, but it's one or the other. It's not anywhere in between. And what we ultimately need to find is that is that sweet spot, kind of not necessarily right in the middle, but you know a little bit on either side as it goes back and forth. And maybe a couple of things to to leave with today in terms of the how and some things that people can can actually take and do for themselves right now. And, and it sounds like you're already doing this to a certain degree, and it, and it brings it back around to Covey and the uh, and the uh, and the rock analogy. But once a week, one thing that I love to do, and I love to to get my clients to do, is to do just a momentary pause. And I so I schedule some time. It could be anywhere from say a half an hour to an hour, say. And first thing I'm doing is I'm looking backward on the week that was. And I'm just doing a, a quick self-assessment, maybe in line with what those, uh, those important changes that I want to do. And I'm looking at them and seeing, okay, what went well? Celebrate. What didn't go so well? Challenges that I experienced. And what were my lessons learned from those challenges so that I can now plan my next week accordingly? And then I go ahead and I look at my next week and I will begin with the boulders and put those into my calendar first. And there's there's three steps that that I'll suggest in terms of prioritizing the boulders. Because like I said earlier, when we are as busy as we seem to be in today's world, everything feels like a priority. So first and foremost, what are your non-negotiables? And and I think you, for yourself, mentioned, you know, my family hmm. trumps business every time. Yep. So for you, family would be a non-negotiable. Yeah. Somebody else, it might be something different. And, and even around that family, it might be something 
very specific around family that is the non-negotiable. So that's for a, a person to decide. So each and every week, the non-negotiable gets put in your calendar first before anything else, right? That's the biggest of the big boulders. Because once again, it's important, but it's probably not urgent. So there's a risk that it'll get bumped if mm -hmm. you don't put it in there or, or not get in, in, in the first place. Then after our non-negotiables is our priority among priorities. And non-negotiables, I kind of like to look at them from the standpoint of non-negotiables are, are forever, forever non-negotiables. Unless something very significant was to happen for some reason, it, possibly it could change. But for the most part, they're the ones that are always the non-negotiable. The priority among priorities is something that may change. It might be, so it's, it's the thing that is next in line. If I was to say, okay, once you've got your stuff about your family into your calendar, and if you could only do one other thing or focus on one other thing in this week ahead, what would it be? Nothing else gets added in yet. And everybody's going to have a bit of a different thing there. It might be on the personal side, away from work, or it might be something that's directly, certainly focused on, on work. And it might come out of assessing those seven waves of real success again in any one of those key areas as to what that is. And maybe you've got a priority among priorities that this is going to be my priority among priorities during this next quarter because it's a, it's a bigger one and I need to make sure that I keep my time focused on it, important but not urgent. Maybe it's a growth step for one's business. Maybe it's a focus in on, on an element of, of working on your business or maybe it's outside of it. That's what goes in your calendar next. Right, So that second highest, second biggest boulder goes in. Then after that, you might have some secondary priorities that are, they're important, but they're not quite as important as that priority among priorities. And they're certainly not as important as the non-negotiable. <laughs> and, and we build those in. And then after that, everything else goes in. After that, it's the sand in the water and fill in all the cracks. And if we do that on a weekly basis, so at the end of the next week, now you look back, what worked, celebrate, what didn't, why, learn from it, and then plan the week ahead, we know that we are going to at least get into our calendar some of the most important things in our world. And over the course of a quarter, over the course of a year, we're going to start to make sure that we give attention to address those seven waves in each of those ones that may be a little off track that we want to have different and start to see and experience those results from that. That allows us to start to create balance. Well, and what you just said too, I think um, is empowering because I think I'm, I'm one of probably many people who are guilty of looking at my calendar as a bit of a, uh, I'm a slave to it. Like I, I can't, I don't have time for anything and I, there's so much stuff in my calendar, but the way that you approached it turns my calendar from being my master to me being the master of it and uh, me kind of yep. owning and being controlled. And that, that's empowering. And I think that's that, that with that empowerment comes like hope and fun even. Love it. Love it. Shifting from my calendar controls me to I control my calendar. And your words were different, but that it's essentially, that's essentially what that is. Uh, and when we can start to do that, we know that we are going to consciously allow ourselves the time, the time blocks to attend to those most important things. Whether we actually do them or not is a bit of a different story <laughs> because even though it's on our calendar, we, we might still let it slip and let it slide, right? And, and even though that it's in our calendar in that way, we could also feel the stress of, yeah, but... I didn't get this added in. I didn't get that added. There's too much to fill my calendar. And at that point, we need to look at it and start to say, okay, what do I need to do? You gave the example, for instance, in wanting to take time off on the days that your kids are, are, are not in school 
and especially at times when it's in your heavy work season, mm-hmm. tax season, um, that can become a challenge and that can become kind of one of those whack-a-moles that comes up and says, yeah, but tax season, you're supposed to work, right? And you need to knock it down and say, I will work, but it's going to be this way, not just the way that it's always mm-hmm. been. And a part of that is is figuring out, and this is going to be something that's unique and different for everybody, uh, what kind of support do I have? Are there things that I can delegate during that time? Can I, uh, can I empower my team to handle that and help them understand and see the importance, the value of that in, in a way that works for them and for you such that it's going to uh, reciprocate with them at, at, at a different point in time perhaps and, and plan accordingly. And maybe it's, and maybe it's the delegation piece to others or maybe it's something that would take a little longer, but we think about um, automating certain aspects of the work that we do. Now, you're not going to do that based on being able to take tomorrow off or next week off, but it's a longer term approach that might allow a little bit more time and freedom when those busiest times come, such that it works along with, say, some of the delegating pieces so that it can work. Um, it's kind of like when you come into the holidays as well. And we know that we often take certain days off. We often take maybe a couple weeks off or in the month of December, how there's so many other things in our calendar, corporate events, personal events, family dinners, and on and on and on and on that happen. And we, we wonder how we're going to fit it all in. And, and ultimately, when we can, when we can prioritize, when we can, you know, delegate, when when it's available for us to do, when there's systems in place to be able to rely on automation, as that can happen, when we can back end and front load things. In other words, if we know that there's a week when it's going to be crazy. I may choose to go out of whack, out of balance the week before and the week afterwards in order to allow me to take that time during that week. Mm -hmm. Not always possible, but it's a way that one can kind of consider that. And knowing that when you bring yourself to a higher viewpoint, one given day might look like it's completely crazy and out of balance. One week might feel like it's still out of balance, but one month, it's a little bit better. And then over the course of a quarter, yeah, it certainly it, it, it spreads out and it's, it's balanced in that way. So what I'm saying with that is, is when, we, when we think about how we can re, you know, work with our calendar, gain control of our calendar, and when we think about uh, why we would want to take a week off in the busiest time of year, and then start to explore, you know, once we got the why and, and why it's important, in your case, the connection with your kids, with your family, and that being a non-negotiable, then it's then it's a question of how. And we often get stuck with, well, that can't be done. <laughs> and instead, shifting the words of that can't be done to how can that be done? Mm-hmm. Now we're open to explore it, right? And then all these things they're saying about delegation or automation or front loading or back loading uh, allow us to explore in this particular situation for this particular task what's going to work and that over the course of a quarter over the course of the year over the course of a career or a lifetime allows a little bit of that ebb and flow of work-life flow work-life harmony work-life balance there you go I think that's a probably amazing way to end. I sure appreciated the time here uh, with Brent. Uh, grateful for you joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we strive to do in the podcast is to help people feel not only with information, but uh, inspired and hope and practical application. And I think you brought a lot of that to the table today, um, not the least of which is your own story. Uh, and so thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights on that. Uh, again, our po- our topic for our podcast today has been balancing your business. Uh, felt I've, I don't know about you, but I felt inspired and excited about the things that we've talked about. 
the balance sheet being a way to gauge your business to being in balance. Um, the things that Brent's taught us about today have ways to gauge if your life is in balance. And if your whole life is in balance, then we're pretty confident you're going to find that your business is just one additional wonderful aspect to this wonderful thing that we call life. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, that concludes our episode of the Business Speak podcast today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified. Simplified. Simplified.